let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 17. We continue our study through Matthew's gospel with the study in Matthew 17 entitled Mountaintops and Valleys. Our last study together in Matthew ended with these words. Chapter 16, verse 27, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, then he will reward each one according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That promise, that prophecy is fulfilled in the first verses of chapter 17, where we read, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said, to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. If you've been walking with us, traveling through the Gospel of Matthew, you will no doubt have been amazed at Jesus' miracles and his wisdom and his, well, passion, his, his mercy, his patience. All that we see in him should amaze us. And if you're familiar with these things, you should be even more amazed. Because while the word of God never changes, we are always changing. And as the word of God is planted in our hearts, a harvest comes forth and more of the word of God and a greater harvest and more of the word of God. So the person you are today, well, that's his best version of you thus far. Are you a finished work? Not even close. Will you be soon? Only if you die and go to heaven or the rapture happens very near. So here's the point. We see him for who he is and what he is and how he functions and know that he is molding and shaping and transforming us into a people that think like him, that speak for him, that act the way he would. If you know his word and if he's with you and in you, you never have to ask, what would Jesus do? You already know what he would do now. Here's what connects all these things and why it's important to us. Every situation, every story, every interaction is about people. Just ordinary people who were chosen by him, loved by him, discipled by him, transformed by him, and then sent out, empowered and used mightily by him. It's all about him and them. And so here's how it plays out in chapter 17. We begin with Peter, James, John, and Jesus. Then we have Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And by the way, Peter recognizes Moses and Elijah. Did you take note of that? He's like, should we make three tabernacles? One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. That answers the oft-asked uh, question. Will we recognize one another in heaven? He recognized them, and he never saw them before. So I think we're going to actually do better there than we do here. I remember John Corson saying in relationship to that question, hey, we won't be any stupider there than we are here, and we recognize one another now. Anyway, it goes from Peter, James, John, and Jesus to Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Then we have Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, John, the Father, and Jesus. 
And then, of course, it, it continues as they come down the mountain. It will be a desperate dad with a demon-possessed son and Jesus. A crowd of disciples and Jesus. Tax collectors, Peter and Jesus. Jesus is the one that brings all this and pulls all this together. And I want to say that as you read through the gospel and today at the things we consider, you take Jesus out of the equation, the stories are absolutely, absolutely different. All the joy we find in them, all the hope we find in them, they are all because of him. You know, Peter and John both make mention of this incident. John does it in John 1.14 where he says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Not just in the way he taught or the mercy he showed or the miracles he did. They saw his glory specifically on the holy mount. Peter makes reference to that. When he says, well, we were with them on the holy mount and we were eyewitnesses of his majesty and glory. He also goes on, Peter does in 1 Peter 1.19 to say, we have something even greater though than that personal experience. We have the more sure word of prophecy, which you do well to heed as a light shining in the dark. I love that phrase, a more sure word of prophecy. Why would he say the prophecies of Scripture are greater than his experience of seeing Jesus as we someday will at the very throne? Because memories can fade, and memories are personal. You see, Peter, James, and John saw this, but they were the only ones that can tell us about it. When we look into the prophecies of the Word of God, well, we're all seeing the same thing. We're all getting the same message, and we all have the same hope. Well, Moses and Elijah appear here speaking with Jesus. Luke 9 says they spoke of his decease. Matthew doesn't tell us what the conversation was all about, but Luke does. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it's important that word decease, literally exodus. It's pointing us to the cross, and here's how we know. Moses brought the children of Israel out of bondage through the sacrifice of an innocent lamb. The blood was shed. The lamb was slain. The blood was shed. The blood was applied. The death angel passed through. Firstborn survived. And the whole community of believers, along with the mixed multitude who just wanted out of Egypt, they all found freedom the next day. Jesus through the cross has set us free from the power of sin and death. He's dealt with the consequences of our sin. He's dealt with the power of sin that dominated and destroyed our lives. And someday we'll stand in his presence and be free forever from the very presence of sin. So there's something else though. In Luke 9, they spoke of his decease which he would accomplish, we go on to read, at Jerusalem. Who but God could call the cross an accomplishment? Of all the things I've set out to accomplish, being tortured and tormented and crucified would never even be on the list. But for Jesus, it was an accomplishment because it's what he came to do. It's the very reason for which he came into this world, that he might die for your sins and mine and for the sins of all mankind. All who believe in him find forgiveness, not just because he loves us, but because he died for us, was buried, and rose again. Well, Moses is real. Important to say that. He's not a mythological creature or, or a person. He's a real man. He had real flaws, real fears, real concerns. He had failures. So with Elijah. Moses, though, and Elijah are representative beyond who they were and what they experienced. Moses represents the law. He was the one to whom the law was given, through whom the law came. In fact, we call the first five books of the Old Testament the books of Moses. 
They're actually the law of God, but nevertheless, hey, quick quiz just to see, because it's good to like, you know, get those connections going and some air going. Um, I, who knows, and, and this is one you don't have to raise your hand, but who can tell me the first book in scripture named after a person? That, that was pretty good. I, I wanted to do the dun, 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 but you were too fast. Listen, why is that important? Because Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they are the history of the creation, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel, the family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And then Exodus, of course, the freedom of the people of God, Leviticus, the law, Numbers, their wilderness wanderings, Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. But Joshua, the first book, named after a person, it turns out Joshua comes from Yahshua, which is the same root and base from which we end up with our English word, Jesus. So, so the point is, Moses doesn't actually have a book named after him, nor does Elijah, but these two represent two of the major, well, movements of God. He moved through the word and through his law. He moved through the prophets as they came to say, thus says the Lord. Something else related to them. Moses died and was resurrected by the Lord. We know he's alive now because he appears here in our story on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord. Elijah never died, not yet at least. Elijah was taken up alive in a chariot of fire, raptured if you will. And so we have Moses representing the law and the law does what? The law brings death. So Moses ends up dying but Elijah represents the prophets because it's the grace of God and the spirit of God and the work of God that brings us life. Moses dies in resurrection, Elijah raptured alive to heaven. Now we see these two again in the book of Revelation. So get this, he's going to say some things to the disciples about Elijah specifically. And they're going to say like, well, why doesn't the scripture, why does the scripture say Elijah must come first? And he's going to say, well, he, he has and he is and he will. But when we get to Revelation 11, and many of you have already studied through it, you know there are two witnesses there in that chapter that during the time of tribulation witness mightily for God. They are given the ability to work specific signs and miracles they can call fire down out of heaven i recall elijah doing something like that they have power over the the rain and 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 such i remember elijah doing something like that that they can turn water to blood and bring plagues upon the earth i remember moses doing those things and so do you so while some will say well what if it's not elijah and moses not a problem but it is most likely them because they're the ones that meet with Jesus to talk about the cross. They're the ones we see alive after one died and the other, one died and was resurrected and the other was raptured. Well, they minister during the first part of the tribulation. Then they are martyred. And when they're murdered and martyred, they're left on the streets of Jerusalem they don't bury them, very unusual in that culture or in any culture. They leave them on the streets, and it says the whole world begins to celebrate because these men tormented them. What's the torment during that time? They preach truth and righteousness, holiness, purity. They call people to repentance. They are God's witnesses among many others in that day, will be long gone, and by long gone I mean in heaven, Worshiping our Lord, we'll have front row seats, but they're balcony seats. Watching this whole thing transpire. These two are murdered and martyred and left on the streets of Jerusalem. The whole world begins to celebrate, which means the whole world is watching. And then after three and a half days, God breathes the breath of life into them. They stand on their feet and he calls them up into heaven. Now track with me on this. It's amazing. These two men. They're the only ones to experience both realities. 
We know Moses had already been resurrected once. We know Elijah had been raptured once. Now they've both been killed. And in the midst of that reality, they're both resurrected. He breathes life into them. And then they're both raptured in the vision and view of all the people. And people begin at that point to really freak out. So all of that sounds perhaps, if you're new to this, a little confusing. Let me make your part simple. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And if you're thinking, but wait, you just said they died and then they were up and then they died and then they were up. Well, they had a little more of an up and down situation, if you will. But we will either die and stand before the Lord or we will be raptured and stand before the Lord. So it's resurrection or rapture either way. Only believers will be raptured. Believers and unbelievers will be resurrected. And I want to encourage you today, if you haven't given your life to the Lord Jesus, do it today. Surrender to the one who gave his life for you. We can cross you off the list and put another name on there. But it's so important that you get this. If you die without Jesus, you die in your sin. And though he paid for your sin, you will pay yourself. The wages of sin is death, not just physical death, but spiritual death, which is separation from God. And if you die in your sin, you will be separated from him eternally. Why does that matter? Because he is the source of all life, of all light, of all joy, of all hope, of everything good. And all that's left, if you're away from him, is darkness and despair and depression and, and hopelessness. And that's what will be happening for millions and billions of people who've refused to believe in the one who gave his life for them. Well, there's hope for believers like Moses or Elijah. Again, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, there will be a resurrection of the dead in Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then 1 Thessalonians 4.17, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. So they rise, we rise, we have this glorious reunion, and then all the focus goes where it belongs. We will be forever with him. We'll worship him. We'll be with him in heaven when he returns to rule and reign on the earth. We'll be with him ruling and reigning upon the earth. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So this, this thing we're looking forward to, it will happen so quickly that one moment we're here and the next moment we're gone. It got me thinking some time back, we, we went and did a will. And, uh, and we're, we're leaving a lot of our stuff with an expectation that, you know, we'll probably die uh, before the Lord comes. And then I thought, man, I might want to rewrite my will. And I came up with an idea. If you have a will and you know a lawyer, uh, you might want to go and redo your will and make sure you're dealing with a non-Christian lawyer. You'll have opportunity to share the Lord because you'll be like, I want to make sure I give my stuff to people who aren't Christian. And, and he'll look at you and say, what? And I want to make sure you're not a Christian and that, that you promise not to become one. And he'll be like, well, why? And I say, because if the rapture happens, I, I want to make sure that somebody's here to execute my will. You can give, you can give uh, all my stuff to the politicians. You can give it to the news media outlets. There'll be a lot of people on the earth in need. But all the people I care about will be with me in heaven. Well, I joke, but maybe not. Anyway, I have a million weird ideas. And, uh, you know, anyway, God sanctifies some of them and actually uses them. So the father here in our story he appears in a glorious, luminous cloud. And we read in one of the other gospel accounts, the cloud descended and covered them. No wonder they were freaked out. You know, it's a bright and shiny day and Jesus is glowing and everything's awesome. And by the way, he wasn't reflecting the glory of God. He was radiating it. What his humanity hid, his glory 
Well, our humanity hides as well our depravity. People can't see how bad we really are within, and that's a good thing. But when people couldn't see how good he was within, they got a preview of that. We don't ever want people to see what's actually inside of us. Our worst thoughts, can you imagine? Our, our worst deeds, our, our, th those things that we wouldn't tell anyone and, and are ashamed that ever even entered our minds. We don't have to worry about that with Jesus because he knows all those things and yet he still loves us. He still chose us. He still laid down his life for us. As the shadow overcomes and overwhelms them, the father speaks as Peter's like, hey, let's set up camp here. And because, you know, Malachi says Elijah's coming first and he's thinking this has to be it. This is the kingdom coming. And, and uh, so he's like, if, if it's pleases you if it's your wish let's set up three tabernacles and get this thing happening but he goes on to say this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased hear him well Jesus and we'll move on in our story but Jesus reassures them in two ways he touches them and he speaks to them and it's interesting how many times in scripture Jesus reassures someone by touching them or speaking to them or both. Well, as they came down, verse 9, from the mountain. I've entitled this Mountaintops and Valleys because we all have those experiences. They come down from the mountain and the glory above is replaced by all sorts of depravity and and difficulties and dangers down in the valleys below. But as they're descending, Jesus commands them, saying, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. He says, I want you to tell people about this, but I want you to wait until I've risen from the dead. And his disciples ask him, why do the scribes say Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, listen, indeed, Elijah is coming. He came in the Old Testament. They've seen him now in the New, but he is coming again prior to Jesus' second coming. As I already mentioned, it's recorded for us there in Revelation chapter 11. He is coming first and will restore all things. But then he says, and this is confusing to some, but I say to you that Elijah has come already. Well, that makes sense. He came in the Old Testament. He's talking here about John the Baptist, and it says so. They didn't know him. They did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. And the disciples understood he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Now, let's clear up any possible confusion related to this. They asked John specifically, are you Elijah? And he says, no. Now Jesus says, well, if you can understand it, he is Elijah. Well, he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. He came to do the very same thing, minus the miracles, because John worked no miracles. But, but um, he came to call people, God's people, to repentance. Do you know we pray for revival and we want to see our, our, you know, lost siblings and parents and children and cousins and nieces and nephews and all that. We want to see them come to the Lord. But revival isn't something that happens in the community of unbelievers. It's something that happens in the community of believers. It starts in the heart of believers. Revival is about, well, listen, listen to the word, revive. To vive means to live. You can't relive something if you're not alive. And so it's about us reliving our lives for the Lord, reliving our experience of, of, of knowing him and experiencing walking with and being obedient to him. So John says he's not. Jesus says he is. All of this is cleared up simply by saying that, that his mission, like Elijah's mission, John's that is, was to call God's people to repentance and, and so Elijah did come Elijah had been with them that very day and now we have a promise of Elijah coming again in the future so what he did in his first coming um, 
Elijah was challenged unbelievers, challenged those who said they were believers to make a decision. If God's God, worship him, he says at one point. If, if Baal's God, worship him. And he even sets up a contest with 450 of them. And guess what? He wins. Well, God wins. So this is our call today, to, to call one another to repentance. Whatever would keep us from pursuing the Lord and being fruitful for the Lord, we need to say, God, forgive me that and, and transform me into the person you saved me to become. You created me to be in the first place. We need to share the gospel, warn people to flee the wrath to come by putting their faith in him. And I do that at every service and I'm trying to do it more and more. And the everydayness, you know, you get a waitress, you try to tell her the story. They always seem like they're in a hurry. And if they're not, then people start to give them bad looks and the manager comes over and then you try to engage him and pretty soon they're asking you to eat elsewhere. But uh, the, the point is there's a time and a place for everything. If you want to keep your job, you probably shouldn't be sharing the Lord on your boss's dime. But you can take your coworkers out for lunch or for uh, something uh, in another time and share with them. Well, John, and last thought, and we'll move on to the, the difficulties in the valley. And there are only three. The mountaintop experience is singular here. The valleys are many, the valley experiences. And, and so uh, John came to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children hearts to the fathers. I, I, I could not imagine a greater need today as we have a whole generation of spiritual orphans. Many are physical orphans, but the majority are spiritual orphans grown up in a home where they were never taught there's a God who made them and loves them and wants to use and bless and, and, and transform them. Man, they need to hear that from us. And if you're a father, you need to make sure your kids know. And if you're a mom, you need to make sure your kids know. If you're a brother or sister, you need to make sure your siblings know. And sometimes it's your parents, you know, I gave my life to the Lord, a real mountaintop experience up in Big Bear, uh, not far above Riverside and, and San Bernardino. It's the San Bernardino Mountains. And, uh, and I was the first in my family. So I shared the Lord with my dad. I shared the Lord with my wife. I shared the Lord with my brother. I shared the Lord with my sister. I shared the Lord with all of them, but I was first. And so it doesn't matter today if you're like, well, my dad should have shared the Lord with me. Or my mom should have. Yeah, they should have, but if they didn't, now it's your chance to share it with them. I shared the Lord with my dad, and he got mad. But you know what? He did later come to the Lord. Pam and I wrote letters to her grandparents and, and just shared how good God was and what he was doing in our lives, and they asked Pam's mom, why are they sending us these sermons? I didn't know they were sermons. I just thought they were the kind of letters a Christian might write if they cared about someone who didn't know what we knew. Well, what happens next is verses 14 through 21, the first of three trials in the valley. A desperate dad, a demon-possessed son, some impotent disciples. And I want to say, and God showed this to me last night as I was chewing on the whole thing after teaching it one time, knowing I'd get two more opportunities, that sometime our valley experience becomes a mountaintop experience for someone else. Let me explain. It's important because they just had the glory ex glorious experience of being with him on the mount, seeing Jesus transformed before their very eyes. They saw a preview of the future. And now they're down in the valley and there's this desperate dad and this demon-possessed kid and, and there's these disciples who tried to help but nothing happened, it didn't work. That's a valley experience for them, you see. But it's gonna become a mountaintop for that father and for that demon-possessed boy. So sometimes we're gonna find ourselves in a situation where we're like, I liked it up there way better. In my case, I liked it over there, the beach, way better. The beach is a mountaintop for me. I don't care what the elevation is. It's a mountaintop experience every time. But, but in the valley here, 
We see lives changing, desperate people finding hope, finding Jesus. And that's what's happening in this particular situation. Well, when they'd come to the multitude, verse 14, a man came to him kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic. He suffers severely. He often falls into the fire and into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all share this story, and they all tell us that it was a demon that was causing these things. So his symptoms were those that an epileptic might suffer, but these were all caused by demonic forces, not merely a disease. So Mark calls him a mute spirit. And the father, he tells us, the father says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. I love that. He doesn't really know at this point what Jesus is capable of, but he has heard, hey, if anyone's going to help you, it's going to be that guy. And so Jesus says to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Listen, some of us need to pray that very prayer today. And if not today, maybe tonight or tomorrow morning, you will find yourself in a place that though you can affirm your belief, you know there's that bit of unbelief. And it's so important that we see it because he's just acknowledging the truth. Lord, you know I have faith, but, but help my unbelief. Help me, Lord. Enable me. So that should be a prayer for some of us, many of us perhaps today. Well, Jesus answered and said, verse 17, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. And the disciples came to Jesus privately and says, why could we not cast it out? It's a good question because earlier on, Jesus had called his disciples to him. He had given them power over disease, over demons. He'd sent them out to preach the good news of the coming kingdom or the kingdom had come. And that, well, to heal the sick and to cast out demons to bring them freedom. And so they're saying, hey, what went wrong? We were called by you. You commissioned us. You empowered us. You sent us out. And yet we failed. And Jesus said, verse 20, because of your unbelief. See, here's a father who says, I believe. Help my unbelief. And they're saying, what went wrong, Lord? He's saying, it's unbelief. You're not, you're not exercising faith in me. It's unbelief. And, and so, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, so important when you hear people saying, you know, what we need is more faith, greater faith. We need a mountain of faith. No, we need mustard seed faith, and that can move the mountain. And so important to know that it's not how much faith we have, but the keys are these. Where is our faith? actually placed do we have faith in potential in man in faith itself or is our faith in a faithful god and that's what we're going to see he says if you have faith as a mustard seed you can say to this mountain move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you however this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting we'll come back to his his conclusion but three things that lead us to it. It's not about our great faith, first of all, but the object of our faith, a great and faithful God. Faith in Jesus is always rewarded. Secondly, if we ask anything according to his will, we know he hears us. And if he hears us, we know he will answer in the affirmative. It's the secret of guaranteeing every prayer will be answered in the affirmative, ask according to his will. And sometimes his will is yes, but wait a little while. Or sometimes his answer is no, because I have something better. 
And sometimes, well, the point is this. Not my will, but yours be done. Lord, I don't know what's best. I only know what I think is best. But I'm limited. You're unlimited. I have no power. You have all power. So, Lord, I'm asking, show me your will. And that's the third thing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you know the word of God, then you know the will of God. We don't have to pray, Lord, if it's your will, would you please save my brother? Would you pre please save my mother? Would you please save my son? Would you please save my husband or wife? Listen, we don't have to pray that because it's not his will. Any perish, but all come to repentance. We can still pray it. Will you do it? But we never have to question if it's his desire. Now, if he says he'll do what we ask if it's in accordance with his will, doesn't that mean that everyone gets saved? No, because he lets people choose. And if he didn't give us a choice, we'd say, well, that's not fair. You're making me go to heaven. No, it wouldn't be heaven if you got there anyway with that attitude. It would mess it up for all of us. But he does want everyone to repent and give their life to him and live their life for him. So faith comes by hearing. And here are two essential disciplines. Jesus mentions them, prayer and fasting. Prayer we're familiar with. Um, it, it's asking, it's seeking, it's knocking. We saw as we studied through that passage early on in Matthew that, that we're to ask and keep on asking. We're, we're to seek and keep on seeking. We're to knock and keep on knocking because he promises we'll find We'll receive, we'll find, and the door will be open to us. And then fasting, that is denying one's physical, temporal, natural needs to focus on God's spiritual, eternal, supernatural will. It's denying one's physical, temporal, natural needs to focus on God's spiritual, eternal, supernatural will. And when I set time aside to pray, and, and Pam's like, hey, you hungry? And I'm like, not now. Why? Oh, well, I probably am hungry. I'm always hungry. But the point is, we have to decide. And in our case, because we live in such a different generation, such a different time historically, especially as it relates to technology. I've mentioned in the past, I'll share again today. If you want to have an amazing fast, don't worry so much about what you're going to eat or not eat. Just turn off everything electronic. And uh, I did that recently. I went down to the beach and with my little brother, Tony, and we spent a week together and, and we went and shared at some churches. And, and uh, anyway, for a season, not all of it, but for a little bit of it, I just turned off everything electronic. It means I had to carry a book because I still wanted to read. And, uh, and I went and sat on a lifeguard stand and read a whole book. That never happens if you're checking your email every 30 seconds or, or checking your text every 10 seconds or, or, or looking at the latest scores of the game or whatever's going on. We are bombarded with electronic media. And, and we are... We're, we're, not me personally, because I, I want to say, like Gollum, I don't have any friends. But um, anyway, you with Facebook friends, you need to know those are not real. And you're like, no, they really like me. They, they, they said they like me. <laughs> Listen, when you're in a crisis, your Facebook friends don't show up. You know who comes to the hospital? Pastor Dick or Pastor Bud or sometimes Pam and I. And, and, and the, the point is this. Real friends are, are friends you can look at and, and, and touch and, and speak to and weep with and, and share your heart with. And, and I'm not saying it's not great to have followers. But, you know, Jesus had a huge amount of followers. And when it came to the cross, none of them were hanging. Just him and two thieves with him. Everybody else but a few disciples and some women that followed after him and those who crucified him and mocked him. They were the only ones left. And that's how it is. When things get rough, you need real friends, ones that can touch you as Jesus touched them and speak to you face to face, heart to heart, eye to eye. Well, anyway, Jesus deals with this situation as only he can. And then 
we come to the second in the three um, valley trials, if you will. While they were staying, verse 22, in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. He told them earlier. He tells them again. He'll tell them all the way up to the night he'll be arrested. He keeps trying to, to explain to them what they couldn't fathom, but somehow they're connecting here heart to heart. Because though they haven't yet processed the whole he's going to die and be resurrected stuff, we know that from later comments on them and by them. Well, they certainly felt his heart. They saw his grief. They heard his sorrow. And they, too, were exceedingly sorrowed. And then it says they came to Capernaum, and those who received the temple tax came to Peter and say, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And he said, yeah. And then he goes in and he's thinking, great, what are we doing? What are we going to do for taxes? When he'd come into the house, and I love this, Jesus anticipated him. He didn't have to say, hey, we have a problem, you know, taxes are due. And, and so it says, what do you think, Simon, from whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or from strangers? Peter said, from strangers. And Jesus said, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook. Take the fish that comes out first, and when you've opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. I like this because Jesus is saying, look, we don't owe it, but we'll pay it anyway, so we're not an offense to them. We do, by the way, owe. We're told to render unto every man that which is due him. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. Uh, Romans 13 says this is one reason we pay our taxes. There are others, but the primary one is because submission to authority over us is submission to God who establishes all authority. And if you, like me, have trouble with taxes, and I don't mean paying them, I mean knowing that we're paying them to people who are so irresponsible and, and, and so corrupt that they have wasted not millions or billions, but now trillions of dollars. And if you're like, how can I give money I work so hard for and we save and we're trying to get ahead and do something with our kids for a vacation and, and the government just wants more and more and more. You know, California is doing great, we read, because they just keep raising the taxes and they're actually piling the money up so when Jerry Brown retires, he can say, look, man, this California was... Just doing great. But we have the largest poverty rate in the country. While we have the richest, sixth, I, sixth or seventh, it goes back and forth, sixth or seventh richest economy in the world, our, our state, compared to nations, we have the greatest amount of people in poverty at the same time. Why? Because, because the system's so burnt and the people's so corrupt. And, but the point is we still have to pay our taxes. And I'm the kind that, though I'm not, you know, a big fisherman, I like fishing. And I, I would go fishing for sure if Jesus said, hey, go find the fish and I'll give you your taxes. Let's try that again, Lord. <laughs> but but here, here's what you need to know about taxes. Just two or three things, and, and I'll conclude this, wind it up. God used Caesar's desire for taxes to move Joseph and Mary to the place where Jesus had to be born. They went to the city of David. They came to Bethlehem because that's the place where the prophecy said Messiah had to be born. So he uses Caesar, not exactly a great guy, not exactly using money for God's purposes, but he still used Caesar to accomplish his purposes. God used a tax collector, Levi, who he names Matthew, who writes this gospel to gather a group of other tax collectors so that he can share his love for them and his plan with them. So God uses everything. A mountaintop experience, we all have them. Valley experiences, we all have them. Couple thoughts and I'll conclude. For some of you, and it's coming soon, 
The mountaintop will be graduation. What's going to happen in the valley? Well, you'll be asking, would you like fries with that? And, uh, you know, and you're like, this is what I get for four years of college and all that studying and all that working. Do you want fries with that? Well, it's not like that for all of you. Some of you will get a real job. Not that that's not. For some of you, the mountaintop will be a wedding. But the valley is learning to live for her, to put her first, to honor those vows and honor the Lord by loving your wife as Christ loved the church. That's a trial, you see. It doesn't come natural. That's where, that's where you have to put into practice these things we say we believe and we affirm and we share. For some, the mountaintop's a new baby. Uh, the valley, endless sleepless nights, weeks, months, and who knows. For some, the mountaintop, your daughter's wedding. The valley, she's gone, but the bills keep on coming. Listen, you can make your own list. Mountaintops and valleys, we all go through them. The main thing is that he's with us on the mountain, and he's with us in the valley. Lord, we're so grateful that you're with us, that you're for us, that you love us, that you know everything about us and you still chose us. You're still transforming us. You're still using us. And Lord, we see in these oh so practical stories that you chose very ordinary people to do very extraordinary things. And these are certainly difficult times. And Lord, we need your wisdom and we need your mind, the mind of Christ. We need your heart, one that breaks for the insanity of the people around us, for the depravity of people around us that, that doesn't lead us to judge them, but Lord, to, to, to reach out to them, to share you with them. And however they respond, Lord, if we speak the truth in love, we know we'll stand before you and here, well done, good and faithful servant. And it's not enough that we know we'll be there, Lord. We want them there as well. So, Lord, help us as we make our list of people we'll be praying for and as we seek opportunity to share with them and to love on them and then work mightily, Lord, bringing them to faith in you and transforming you, transforming them, Lord, through that that experience of walking with and growing in you. And if you're here today and you've never said, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my every sin, today is the day of salvation. And right here, right now, if you need to give your life to Jesus, I'm saying do it now. Surrender to him. He gave his life for you. Give your life to him. He died for your sin. Live your life for him. And if that's you and you've never prayed it, I'd ask you to raise your hand. Hold it high so I can see you wherever you are. And I'll pray for you and with you. Awesome, I see your hand there in the middle. Wonderful, brother. And I see your hand as well. Amazing, awesome. Who else here ready to say yes, Lord, right now, right here, for now and forever? I give you my life. I surrender to you. I believe in you that you died for my sin, were buried and rose again. Awesome. I see your hand there as well. Wonderful. Anybody else want to join these few before we pray together? Maybe in the overflow. Maybe you're logged on or listening in. God sees you and loves you and chose you and he's speaking to you through his word. Anybody else? You who raised your hand, anyone who wants to pray along, pray aloud after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. For loving me in spite of all I've done and all I've thought and all I've failed to do that would have pleased you. Thank you for going to the cross in my place for dying and bleeding there for my sin. I give my life to you because you gave your life for me. 
I'll live my life for you because you died for my sin. You were buried. You rose again. And I look forward to hearing that trumpet sound and joining you in worshiping at your very throne. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen.